How do you acquire the right to make a movie based on a book? The short version is it's usually handled in a way that's pretty similar to how a producer buys the right to make a film based on a screenplay. Uh, that is through an option agreement, also known as an option slash purchase agreement. In a film rights option agreement, the production company acquires the option to purchase the right to make a film based on the book. That is, the company pays for the exclusive right for some period of time, like six months or a year, to make a film based on the book. But how do you go about negotiating and drafting this kind of agreement? Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about in this very video. But first, a few disclaimers. Uh, first, this is not legal advice because, of course, if I were going to give you legal advice, I'd have to understand your specific situation and your specific needs. And right now, I'm just a lawyer talking to you on the internet. Uh, number two, I'm primarily going to be talking about issues of United States law. So if you are making your film or you plan to make your film outside the United States, what I'm going to say in this video won't necessarily apply to you. Also, if you found the content of this video helpful, please like this video and subscribe to this channel so that I can keep providing this kind of educational content to enterprising, young, hungry indie filmmakers like yourself. Uh, before you start preparing or you hire an attorney to start preparing uh, an agreement to purchase the film rights based on a book, you need to understand who owns those rights. If the author hasn't transferred the right to make a film based on their book to anyone else, they're going to own those rights. The author is going to own those rights by default. If the author published the book themselves, they probably haven't sold or optioned the film rights. And so you should probably approach the author or their representative, if they have one, if you want to discuss buying the film rights. Uh, usually the agent or manager of the writer, if they have representation, is going to be fairly easy to identify with the Google search. And the author will probably have their own website with some kind of contact information as well. Uh, if the book was published by a publishing house, it's likely that they will own the film rights, or they'll at least have permission to license the film rights, so they would be the ones to talk to, at least in the beginning. It's also important to research whether the rights have been optioned or sold to someone else already. Uh, one way to find out more information about that is to look at the U.S. Copyright Office website at copyright.gov. Sometimes you'll look up a particular book in the Copyright Office catalog and find in its entry what's called a notice of transfer, um, which shows that certain rights associated with the book have been transferred, and these might include the film rights. People who sign literary film rights purchase agreements don't necessarily give this information to the Copyright Office, so you're not 100% guaranteed uh, to find out the information you need by checking there, but it is a good research tool. Uh, now let's get on to the next issue, which is what kind of agreement should you use to acquire the right to make a film based on a book. Um, generally, like I mentioned, a production company usually doesn't buy the film rights outright. Usually what they do is they sign an option agreement with the author or the publisher, uh, whoever holds the relevant film rights. Uh, that is, they sign an agreement saying that for some period of time, the production company has the exclusive right to buy the right to make a film based on the book. So it's not the right to make a film that you buy when you first sign the option agreement. It's the right to buy the right to make the film, uh, if that makes sense. The production company usually uses that period of time to try to raise funds to make the film, uh, to put together a screenplay based on the book, to try to attach talent, that is try to get actors interested in the project. Um, the company takes less of a risk by buying the option than it would take by just buying the film rights outright. Uh, after all, maybe the production company might hire a writer to do a screenplay based on the book and the screenplay won't turn out particularly good. Um, or maybe the producers will try to raise funds, but none of the investors will be interested. In this type of situation, if the, all the producers bought was an option to make a film based on the book rather than buying the actual film rights, um, they're not going to end up being the proud owner of film rights that they can no longer do anything with. And they'll have spent less money because the price of an option is usually something like 10% of the price that you would pay to acquire the actual film rights themselves. What are the basic ingredients of a literary option agreement? Um, those would be the option period, the option price, and the purchase price. The option period is the period of time in which the production company has the exclusive ability to buy the film rights in a book. It's often six months to a year, like I said, but it could be longer. Uh, sometimes the agreement gives the production company the ability to pay a fee to extend the option period, maybe more than once, if the company wants more time to try to get the project underway. During the option period, like I mentioned, the producers are the exclusive holders of the option. That means that during the option period, the rights holder can't sell the film rights to anyone else and can't option them to anyone else. This is important because during the option period, the production company is trying, like I said, to raise funds and attach talent and so on. And if the author 
or the rights holder could just sell the film rights to somebody else during that period of time, then all that investment of time and money by the producers would end up being for nothing. Uh, so to give the production company the incentive to invest in trying to get this film made during the option period, the rights holder promises that they won't sell the option or the film rights to anyone else during that period of time. The option price is the fee that the production company has to pay just to get the option. That is just to get the exclusive ability to purchase the right to make the film rather than the film rights themselves. The option price can be effectively whatever the parties can negotiate, but it tends to be in the neighborhood of about 10% of the purchase price. Uh, that is the price that the production company would have to pay to acquire the film rights. Usually this fee is non-refundable. So even if the producer chooses not to exercise the option and buy the film rights, the book's rights holder keeps the fee. Um, this basically is meant to compensate the rights holder for giving the production company the exclusive ability to buy the film rights and giving up the ability to sell those rights to anyone else uh, during the option period. Finally, we have the purchase price. Um, that's the price that the production company can choose to pay during the option period to acquire the film rights in the book. Uh, what's a typical purchase price for the film rights in a book? It tends to be around 2 to 3% of the budget of the film, or it may be 2 to 3% of the film's budget with some kind of maximum. Um, that is, the contract might say that even if 2 or 3% of the budget comes out to more than $100,000, the writer won't receive more than a maximum of $100,000 uh, as the purchase price. But ultimately, like the option price, it's whatever the production company and the rights holder can negotiate. The purchase price might also have a contingent compensation aspect to it. Um, that is, instead of the compensation being a totally upfront fee, um, the writer or the rights holder may get some percentage of the profits that the film ultimately makes. What other kinds of provisions should these agreements have in them? Um, we'll start with the kind of terms that are meant to protect the production company. The agreement should, uh, first and foremost, say that the production company will have complete creative control over the script and the film. You, the production company, want to make sure that the writer or whoever holds the rights can't come back and complain that you're ruining their book with your film uh, and demand that you not release the movie without their consent or something along those lines. If the writer has a ton of bargaining power, if they're sort of a, a J.K. Rowling or John Grissom-like figure, uh, they may be able to ask for a clause that allows them to approve the script or the film before the movie can come out, um, or that they'll act as a consultant, sometimes as a paid consultant, uh, whether working with the screenwriter to try to accurately reflect the material in their book or actually being on set. Um, that's definitely not ideal for the production company, the writer and the director. Another important thing to include in these agreements from a production company perspective is a clause stating that the rights holder will indemnify the production company in the event that some third party sues the production company based on the contents of the book. Uh, so suppose that you, the production company, buy uh, the film rights in a book. But then someone comes along and claims that the author of the book plagiarized their work. Because your film uses the allegedly plagiarized dialogue, this person comes after you. They file a lawsuit against you as well. In this situation, particularly if the writer did plagiarize the work of this third party who's suing, it seems fair that the writer should pay whatever attorney's fees and whatever costs that you have to pay as a result of the lawsuit. That's what an indemnification clause like the one that I'm talking about is supposed to accomplish. Um, or in some situations, it's possible that the rights holder could simply overlook the fact that they don't own the rights that they're claiming that they're able to transfer to you. Uh, maybe, for instance, the author is the person that you're dealing with and you know they don't have their own legal department. They're not particularly legally savvy. So they don't understand that in some contract that they signed 10 years ago or something like that, they gave their publisher the ability to license the film rights in the book and they no longer hold those rights. Uh, in that case, you want to make sure that the author's on the hook for any expenses that you might have to pay if the production company came along and said, hey, the author didn't have the ability to assign these film rights to you. We did. And now the fact that you're making this film uh, violates our rights and we're going to sue you. Also, I always talk about this kind of clause, but it's very important to have what's called a no injunctive relief provision. Uh, and that's a provision saying that the rights holder can't go into court and get a judge to issue an order saying that you can't release the film because obviously that would be disastrous for you and whatever distributor you end up signing with to distribute the film. Uh, instead, if you have this kind of no injunctive relief clause, the only kind of relief that the rights holder can get is money in the event that they can prove that you breached the contract, which, although it's not 100% ideal, you'd rather be giving them nothing, is better than the film being completely shut down. Uh, if you're a production company, your distributor is probably going to require in their contract with you that you put this clause in the contracts of anyone 
making a creative contribution to your film. Now let's talk about a couple of clauses uh, that can be in an option slash purchase agreement that are meant to protect the writer. Sometimes these agreements contain what are called reservation or holdback clauses. What these clauses say is that the rights holder grants the production company the right to make a film based on the book, but not some other kind of entertainment property. Like they might specifically exclude a video game or a stage play or something like that. Um, or the holdback clause might say that the production company is only getting the right to make one film based on the book and not necessarily the right to make it a sequel or, or a derivative work based on the film. So in that kind of situation, for instance, the, um, the production company couldn't split the book up into three films like Peter Jackson did with The Hobbit. Um, or the production company might get the right to make sequels or the right to adapt the book to some other kind of entertainment property. But if they choose to do that, they're going to have to pay an extra fee uh, above and beyond the option fee and the purchase price that are already being charged to the producer uh, under the agreement. Another type of clause you might see in a literary a film rights purchase agreement is what's called a reversion clause. Uh, under this type of clause, even if the production company buys the film rights, those rights will go back to the writer if the production company fails to make the film within some period of time. Uh, this is usually a long period of time, like four to seven years, considering how long it can take to get a movie made. Another clause that the writer and their representatives can use to protect the interest of the writer uh, is a clause that has to do with the credits that the writer is going to get in the film. So the language in these kinds of credit clauses varies very widely. Uh, maybe the clause will say that the author has to be mentioned in the actual title of the film. Uh, like with that um, Frank Herbert's Dune adaptation that was made by the Sci-Fi Channel, I think back in the early 2000s. I don't know why that random example came to mind. But that was an example where the author got the right to include his name in the actual title of the film. Or, or the contract could say that the author needs to get a separate title card in the opening titles, in the opening credits of the film. So in other words, there needs to be a moment where only the author's name and no one else's name is displayed on screen. Again, this is the kind of clause that can widely vary from contract to contract, depending on what the parties are able to negotiate with each other. So I hope that was helpful to you in understanding how the process of buying uh, the right to make a film based on a book can go. And thanks for watching.